from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Coming up on Ag Day, he's not your ordinary dog. He's working to what we need at that exact moment. Meet this hardworking canine who is one of the top dogs in the country. A strange but true post why weather officials were warning people about falling iguanas. And the U.S. starts negotiations on a new trade front. They make it impossible. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths with a phase one trade deal now in place with China. The Trump administration is taking on a new trading partner, the European Union. Speaking at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, President Trump said he would impose new tariffs on European car imports if the EU doesn't agree to a new trade agreement. Earlier this week, France reached a truce with the U.S. over a proposal to tax American internet companies, but other European countries haven't, and that could lead to more trade battles. The United States has been losing $150 billion and more for many years, $150 billion more. I mean, really more than that with the European Union. They have trade barriers where you can't trade. They have tariffs all over the place. They make it impossible. They are, frankly, more difficult to do business with than China. We have a great relationship with China now. We had some testy moments, very testy, beyond testy. Worse than a lot of people would understand. But we got it done, and I think phase two will go nicely also. But with the European Union, and frankly, I'll be honest, I wanted to wait till I finished China before I went to work on, respectfully, Europe. But the president of the EU Commission said she had very good talks with President Trump while in Davos. Now, as far as phase two with China, U.S. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin is downplaying talk that trade discussions with China will be wrapped up by this November's presidential election. While speaking at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Mnuchin said there was no deadline to the phase two discussions. Last week, the U.S. and China signed off on a phase one agreement, which eases some sanctions on China, while Beijing has agreed to step up its purchases of U.S. farm products and other goods. However, many issues remain unresolved, and tariffs imposed by President Trump remain in place. But one tariff is being reduced. The Office of U.S. Trade Representative publishing a notice in the Federal Register stating that on February 14th, the tariff on certain Chinese goods will be reduced to 7.5 percent. That's down from 15 percent put in place in August. The USTR saying the tariff modification is because of the Phase 1 agreement. Regarding that Phase 1 deal, Chinese Vice Premier Han Zheng telling the World Economic Forum the country's trade deal with the U.S wouldn't hurt rival exporting nations. Some governments complaining that they were left out of the agreement. Han saying a commitment to purchase more from the U.S. is in line with its World Trade Organization obligations and won't squeeze out other imports. Han also pledging to lower barriers for foreign investors. There's concern what a new coronavirus that has sickened hundreds of people in central China could mean for the markets. China has now confirmed 500 cases of the virus and 17 deaths. The virus has spread outside of China, with the U.S. confirming the first case in a man in Washington state who had traveled to Wuhan recently. Other countries have also reported confirmed cases. The news hit China's financial markets and raised concerns. It might wallop the economy just as it appears to be regaining momentum. The new U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement appears to be moving another step forward. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is pushing legislators to quickly approve the deal. But Reuters is reporting the opposition party wants to study that deal. Canada is the only country that still needs to approve it. President Trump still needs to sign the agreement for the U.S. after it was approved in the Senate last week. Our weather team is tracking another big weather maker heading across the country. Meteorologist Mike Hoffman joins us with an update. Thanks, Clinton. Yeah, that's right. Another storm system moving through the middle of the country. This is going to be a messy one once again. You can see two areas of low pressure right now, one southern Minnesota, one northeast Texas. They come together, though, over the central Mississippi Valley over the next 36 to 48 hours. And here's a pretty wintry scene. This is from Janelle Rempel in Canada. Look at the ice on the line there and the beauty of the trees in the background. Just a wonderful but obviously icy scene there in parts of Canada. I'll have more on your forecast coming up in just a little while. 
A new report says Americans are drinking less wine. Fooddive.com says wine consumption in the U.S. dipped last year for the first time in 25 years. It represents a loss of just under 1% from the previous year. The data firm also saying beer volumes dipped 2.3% last year, representing the fourth straight year of declines. But craft beer consumption increased by 4%. You're looking at a new strawberry variety released by the USDA. It says it has been shown to have a significantly longer shelf life than several other popular varieties. In fact, USDA says it has a 29% lower rate of degradation. The spring-bearing keepsake strawberry is also reported to have excellent flavor and sweetness, a juicy texture, and reliable yields. The variety was increased for distribution at a Northern California nursery. When we come back, a look at those MFP payments, what they have meant for farm income, and preparing for them to go away. Later, a special honor for man's best friend who's one of the biggest helpers on the farm in the country. Starbucks says it is making a new sustainability commitment. The company's CEO is saying it wants to become resource positive by storing more carbon than it emits, eliminating waste, and providing more clean, fresh water than it uses. It says one of the ways is to expand plant-based menu options by migrating toward what it sees as a more environmentally friendly menu. There's concern what this could all mean for the dairy industry. Farm Journal's Tyne Morgan recently speaking with dairy leaders, many putting a lot of hope that coffee could help with fluid milk demand. Well, I think coffee has been, is milk's new best friend. Uh, they hang out together a lot and coffee still has a lot of upside. If you look at it, for example, in China, Starbucks is opening a new outlet in China every 15 minutes, I've read. Well, there's a lot of milk that goes along with that stuff, right? So I think that coffee is, is a good friend for traditional milk. Starbucks also saying it will shift from single use to reusable packaging. It's estimated that Starbucks uses about 6 billion cups a year. Soybeans continuing the downward trend on Wednesday. The market still not seeing any new U.S. ag buys from China. Here's more from the scene. Today in the grain market, the soybeans did stabilize today. The open interest is increasing and that kind of softened uh, the decline that we've been having over the last couple of days. Uh, we're battling some weakness anyway. Also, there are some issues with that China virus uh, and that, that has a uh, uh, some traders a little bit worried about which way to go on that. But there is some cautious optimism that the open interest buying uh, could be indicate that we're, we might be slowing down a little bit, but that's the best uh, optimistic thing that we can get right now. Now, corn was a little bit firmer today. Uh, the price is kind of uh, stalled as we're waiting to see if there's any China action. You know, after the phase one signing, there really hasn't been a whole lot of purchases or anything to really stand by. Uh, what we were expecting. But the futures are really eyeing that $4 mark. Can we get there? Uh, we're kind of, you know, crossing our fingers right now because the silence out of China has everyone a little bit worried. But the USDA inspection uh, was a little bit off as well, and I think that maybe that's holding the market back. Now, wheat is the one that's super volatile right now. We did make a new high, and it's been a new high since 2018. And even today, maybe it's as far as back as 2015 because the market's been relatively wild. Interestingly enough, though, a big recoil uh, midday that kind of surprised everyone. The market pulled back uh, almost 15 cents uh, and it, even Kansas City off its high 504 and three quarters and then it came back down under that $5 mark. A report from a government policy watchdog is raising concerns about those China trade aid payments to American farmers. The report is from the National Foundation for American Policy. Now it advocates for more congressional oversight over the billions of dollars taxpayers paid out to the U.S. ag sector relative to the market facilitation program. Now, the report claiming the taxpayer cost of the trade aid program exceeded federal funding for the State Department, the Navy's shipbuilding expenses, maintaining the U.S. nuclear arsenal, and NASA. The report saying the $28 billion in aid to farmers raises questions about the tariffs and the use of funds to mitigate the fallout. Tommy Grusafi with Advanced Trading, our guest in studio today. Tommy, let's talk about the MFP payments, because we know what that's meant for the bottom line for farmers. And, you know, a couple of years ago, the Ag Secretary said it was a one and done payment, and then we got a second one. Uh, now we're waiting to see if there could be a third one, although they say there isn't. 
One thing we've learned about from the, agri the Secretary of Agriculture is that we have a food safety policy. We're going to ask the farmer to keep producing huge bushels. This goes all the way back to Dr. Earl Butt saying we're going to plant fence posts to fence posts. Only thing missing is the fence posts are gone. Right. Sonny Purdue's got the American farmers back. President Trump says he's got their back. Prices tend to go really low. We know it's hurting farmers financially. They give us more MFP. I couldn't imagine what it looks like next year if we grow 93, 94 million acres of corn. Uh, if we lose some of our markets, you know, the farmers might need aid again. They say they're not going to do it, but we're going to have a, 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 we want to produce a ton of high quality, affordable food in America. When you look at the farm bill, the money we give to the farmers is actually a small little piece. There's a lot of other things that go into that few, food security, food safety. Hmm. I believe that the American farmer, the greatest advice we can give them right now is that to get used to marketing grain with big bushels and low price. It's unfortunate that they're going to the mailbox and having a look in there, and that's making the difference of whether they're losing a little money, breaking even. We even have some clients who did exceptionally well this year. They're not bragging about it, but if you had the bushels, the basis, and the MFP, you should have had a good year. So if we don't have an MFP payment, uh, if we take them at their word, uh, we look at this trade deal kicks in and we start really selling, uh, the demand returns, we don't have an MFP payment, do you think it's going to be a, a hard transition given what we've done the last couple of years? I do. I currently sit in a bank in North Dakota and I sit with the bankers and we have coffee and we talk about this and, and things are incredibly tight right now. If you extract $14 billion from the ag economy, look what happened with low milk prices for a few years. We lost 850 dairies in Wisconsin. I think next year could be a very challenging year financially if prices just stay mediocre and the MFP payment's gone. It could be really tight for people who are already on that cusp of hurting financially. All right. Well, it'll be something to watch. Of course, uh, we'll have to see how this year plays out. Appreciate it, Tommy. Thank you for being here. We'll be back with more Ag Day and a check of weather coming up. Interested in spending a day with a trader? Call Tommy Grisafi at 800-664-4383. Hear something a little different. We routinely pass along warnings on social media from the National Weather Service when it comes to rain and snow, but temperatures were dropping so low in South Florida that they're warning people to watch out for falling iguanas. <laughs> NWS Miami posting this on its official Twitter page that people shouldn't be surprised if they see iguanas falling from trees as lows drop into the 30s and 40s. Apparently, the low temperatures stun the invasive reptiles, but the iguanas won't necessarily die. That means many will wake up as those temperatures rise. And Mike, <laughs> it did get pretty cold all the way down into Florida. It did, and I'm sure there was a frost all the way into Central Florida, but I've never heard that one before. <laughs> That's, That's right. an interesting one. Here's the way the weather map looks this morning. You can see high pressure along the eastern seaboard, high pressure in the west, except for the northwestern parts of the country, and then the activity is in the middle of the country. So let's put the maps into motion. You can see snow this morning, northern Missouri northward, rain southward from there, and that's kind of going to be the battleground for a little while here over the uh, central Mississippi Valley. It's generally light snow farther north. That cold front's uh, bringing some cold air into New England, but the storm system itself is pulling up uh, warm, more humid Gulf air, pulling down a little bit colder air behind it, but this is not Arctic air anymore. So we're going to have a mixture over the southwestern Great Lakes as we start the day on Friday. Snow all the way down into northern Arkansas. It might be raining in southwestern Michigan. Kind of a strange setup, but that's the way it goes sometimes. And you can see the storm system near Indianapolis by late in the day Friday. And a fair amount of its rain until you get to the north, northwest, and the western sides of it. Next cold front causing just some rain and uh, mountain snows in the northern Rockies. And we have another lurking system off the west coast as we head into the weekend. Here's a precipitation estimate over the past 24 hours. Most of the heavy stuff's been in eastern Texas into southern Louisiana, adding in the next 36. Look at our model putting down one to two inches over a good chunk of the southeastern parts of the country. All of this light stuff up here is generally in the form of snow. So there you go, over the past 24 hours, mainly Iowa, Wisconsin, northern Michigan. Adding in the uh, next 36, you're going to add some into extreme north uh, western Indiana, then it turns back to rain, and eventually this snow will turn it back to snow as we head into the weekend. But at least through Friday, the heaviest is over Missouri, northern Wisconsin, and the UP of Michigan, 
and obviously the higher elevations in the Rockies. Take a look at high temperatures this afternoon. No Arctic air left, but it's still in the 30s in a good chunk of the country. 60s though by the time you get down to the Gulf Coast. Low temperatures uh, tonight are going to be, or uh, tomorrow morning I should say, going to be in the mid 50s in Florida. So that's a little bit of a warm up. Single digits, maybe in a few spots in the far northern plains, and the chilly weather continues as we head into the day tomorrow. There's the uh, jet stream. <clears throat> There's that storm system. See how it cuts off? That's why it's going to be a very slow mover. Uh, Saturday, it's moving into the northeastern parts of the country. Then it moves off to the east. Not a whole lot of cold air behind it, but then we do see a little bit colder air and maybe another storm system as we head through the middle and latter parts of next week. That's a look across the country. Now let's take a look at some local forecasts. We head to Yuma, Arizona, first of all, mostly sunny and comfortable, high of 72 degrees. Copper Harbor, Michigan, cloudy, a couple of snow showers, high of 32. And finally, Brunswick, Georgia, lots of clouds, rather cool today, high around 58 degrees. New information involving a dairy plant facing a lawsuit over wastewater. Why plant leaders are denying those allegations. We have an update, plus big changes could soon be coming regarding grazing rules in the western part of the country. That's next in Drovers. Our partners over at Drovers report the Bureau of Land Management is preparing to overhaul regulations on 155 million acres of public lands across the western U.S. The BLM publishing a notice of intent in the Federal Register this week. It is also opening a public comment period and will hold in-person meetings in four locations. Agency saying it will address grazing permit procedures, land use planning, and how best to use grazing to address and reduce wildlife risks. It also says changes will address how it handles unauthorized grazing on public lands. Right now, the BLM administers 18,000 permits and leases for livestock grazing on roughly 60% of the 245 million acres it manages across the nation. An update to a story we first brought you earlier this week about a southern Missouri city suing a dairy plant claiming it is regularly releasing untreated wastewater into a river. Now the concern is in the city of Kabul, Missouri, the city asking for more than a million dollars in its suit against a Dairy Farmers of America plant saying it has to spend more money with its own wastewater treatment to take care of the problem. Well, an executive vice president of DFA says it started working with the city of Kabul to fix the situation long before the lawsuit was filed. In a statement, Monica Massey of DFA says, quote, we deny the allegations that they're making against us. They're putting the blame squarely on DFA. And we would say that while we use the facility and there are times that we might overburden the facility, the blame doesn't fall on us, end quote. Adding DFA has its own wastewater treatment plant. DFA says the city of Kabul refuses to work with them toward a solution at this point. Coming up, we pay tribute to some of the hardest working paws on the farm. Meet this year's American Farm Bureau Dog of the Year next. Dogs are being put to work in orchards sniffing out citrus greening disease. Watch this dog. Researchers with USDA have been training and evaluating canines for five years in Florida, and they recently started working in California. They say the dogs can detect the bacterium that causes the disease over 95% of the time in commercial trees. They said they couldn't see any difference in how the dogs reacted between citrus species and varieties, and they say the dogs could detect the bacterium in some of the trees as early as two weeks after infection. And it only takes them a few minutes to assess all the trees, even in large yards. And talking about some very good dogs, a contest that celebrates all those farm dogs who work alongside farmers and ranchers every day. The winner of the 2020 Farm Bureau Farm Dog of the Year Award has been announced. Meet Flint. He's an 11 and a half year old Australian Shepherd. His human friends are Rhett and Beth Crandall of Utah. Now Beth says her grandma gifted Flint to her when he was just a puppy. She says Flint helped her exercise her 4-H and FFA livestock and now helps out on the couple's ranch. Rhett says every time he and Flint are together, he knows they're going to get a lot of work done. At a later age in his life, he has this natural intuition to see things and perceive things and to work with the livestock in a way that us humans cannot. 
when it's able to go out there and move the herd in a very low stress way and knows how to keep the group together and is able to change how he's working to what we need at that exact moment. Beth says sometimes Flint knows what the cattle need better than she does and he does it all by natural instinct. She says recently they got a couple of younger dogs that he's now mentoring, but the couple say at the end of the day, Flint is also a part of the family. Flint gets a trophy, some prize money, and a year's worth of Purina dog food. Great job, Flint. And that's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. It's been part of your day with us from all of us here at Ag Dan Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day.